Um, we bought this wood 16 years ago and we've just moved out of London. We were looking for a better environment for the children really. They were just at the age when they needed to go to school. So we found the nice village, we found the house and then across the road there was this sign saying woodland for sale. And I actually grew up in a housing estate where there weren't any trees and I didn't really realise that woods actually belonged to anybody. And so after a few weeks of seeing this sign saying woodland for sale, I phoned the agent and said, how much is a wood? And actually, because this wood is leasehold and not freehold, it was a lot cheaper than I expected and a lot less than the house that we just bought. So um, it seemed like a good investment and we, t we sort of explained it to ourselves as an ethical investment. And then we've just had a lot of fun in here in the last 16 years. And we, we actually bought it from the Forestry Commission. And what lots of people don't realise is that the Forestry Commission were selling off small woods that they couldn't really um, manage economically even back then. Hales Wood is 65 acres and it's an ancient woodland site so this wood has been here and was mentioned in the Doomsday Book um, so been here for centuries. It's actually since the 50s and the early 60s was over planted with oak and beech and more recently conifers um, but one section of the wood, a third of it, is actually a national nature reserve. And it, I think it was one of the first national nature reserves in the country. And it's a, a site of special scientific interest because of the ground flora. So we've got a part that's a nature reserve which has been coppiced continuously. And we have a plantation. And underneath that we've got the ancient woodland. What we've been trying to do is in a way turn the clock back. Um, but not in a sort of negative reactionary way we're trying to do new things with the wood as well but we've taken out the spruce most of the spruce that's gone and we're thinning out the beach because actually beach, beach is not native to this area either because it doesn't like to have its feet so wet and this wood is classified as a wet ash maple wood so ash and field maple and we also have aspen and um, hornbeam those are the, the the predominant native trees so even these lovely oak trees that we have here they're not actually they wouldn't have been here not in this form anyway unless they've been planted but actually they are our future timber crop um, because we're thinning them out so that they grow straight and they they've put on a lot of growth since we took out the rows of spruce from between them and opened up canopy a bit. The management of the wood started um, um, well 16 years ago when we, the day we completed on the sale I couldn't sleep that night because I thought oh no such a responsibility and all the trees are going to blow down and so it was quite scary um, but I think we were helped by the fact that as I say part of the wood is a national nature reserve and natural England um, were still managing it and still are so immediately I had somebody to talk to and um, the guy from the Forestry Commission who had been managing it previously was also very willing to talk to me about um, how to go about doing the things that we wanted to do and the first thing I wanted to do was to get out some of the conifers it felt like we were, I was really going to cut my teeth by getting out a good amount of, of, of the conifers because obviously they needed to go and so um, the Forestry Commission talked me through informally how to get subcontractors sub and how to get people involved in actually doing the work. So I was, I was, I suppose, I was project managing. I wasn't wielding the chainsaw myself. But the fun of that was that very first lot of um, thinnings that we took out enabled me to buy that articulated dumper truck that we've got in the wood. And so there was an immediate reward and immediate fun to be had of getting the contractors in and getting started and so we just carried on from there really but Paul and I had a bit of a swap around so at first I was managing the woods for say the first five years as a kind of project manager getting the guys in watching them work which is quite fun and um, getting the management plan and the grant applications all sorted and sort of coordinating things and then I think Paul decided he was missing out on the fun, decided he wanted to give up, give up the day job, so he gave up his um, commuting to London and Brussels and places to stay at home with 
me and with the children. And then I went back to my, my actual profession is I'm a social worker. So I went back to doing social work and Paul got stuck in um, looking after the wood. And his style was completely different to mine. So his style is to get the chainsaw and start getting stuck in, you know, one-to-one -one with the trees and um, doing as much as he could on his own really so we've had a mixture of contractors and ourselves individually managing the wood and luckily now I've got two grown-up sons who've grown up with this wood since they were two and four and the youngest it seems actually more interested than the older one but he Peter is now in here chopping logs so wielding the axe under the supervision of his father, of course, she hastens to add. Um, so then Paul's got more into making charcoal and uh, selling firewood. Um, but yes, getting the contractors in is still fun for the big jobs as well. So in terms of what goes on in the wood, um, the wood is leasehold, so the freeholder retained the hunting, shooting, coursing and sporting rights so um, pheasant shooting goes on and we don't have any control over that but we do all work around each other and try not to get in each other's way up until recently we had the uh, fox hunt as well which again is something that we weren't in a position to um, comment on really although we do ask them to keep off soft rides and you know give each other space and uh, let each other know when it's happening and um, now we've got um, a guy working in the nature reserve in the coppice part who's making lots of new and interesting stuff with all the coppice products so that's really good and um, in terms of family and friends um, Paul and I did foster for a few years and so we, we always had lots of children in the woods for birthday parties and camping out and just letting off steam. We looked after a little girl who was three who liked to scream and scream a lot every day. Um, whenever things got too much for us, she would just go into getting off her chest by screaming a lot. So this is a good place to do that. Um, we've just had lots of people in um, from the different wildlife groups and botanists and um, people doing research of all different kinds and different ages really so it, but it's, it's all quite informal and I've got quite a large family and we like to have what they're now called cousins campovers so we, bon we camp we have bonfires that kind of thing one of the great things about having a wood for somebody like me who's basically a townie is that since we've had it I've become really aware of the seasons and what happens in the wood does vary a lot from season to season and particularly for Paul who works more directly in the coppicing and the chopping of the firewood so that for instance he'll be in the nature reserve um, felling the coppiced area that's chosen for that year um, in the worst part of the winter really he prefers to get in there sort of January uh, through to March which is heavy going um, at the moment when it's not too boiling hot he'll be chopping logs, uh, sawing. Um, we've got some great some beach that was felled recently because the beach was dying. So it, the, it, the contractors felled it for us, which was great. It's in a big stack. So he's working his way through turning that into firewood, getting that into the shed to dry. And then we'll sell that bit by bit as and when people want it. Um, and then of course the camping and the picnicking and all of that stuff happens in the spring when the bluebells are out. Um, so it's, it's all very seasonal and very beautiful at different times of year really. And one of the best things about owning a woodland is that it's just such an amazing place and it's an amazing place to come and be on your own. And I've never felt nervous on my own here at all. It's just magical to me. And I suppose that's a combination of never having had anything to do with woods in my early life, but having been heavily into romantic poetry and you know, Thomas Hardy and literature. So to me, it's such a privilege to be able to come and experience this kind of environment. And the fun things about it are being on your own, but then also bringing on the people and seeing what happens when they come. And I think it's genuinely the case that every time I come to the wood, 
I'll see something different and something will be different and something will happen. So sometimes if I'm feeling really miserable, <laughs> I know that if I come to the woods, something will happen. For example, um, when we first bought the woods and the children were quite small, they were actually quite nervous about the wood, having lived in London up until that point. And so I felt it was my job to increase their confidence in the wood. And I remember one day creeping through, actually this part of the wood, creeping down through the oak trees and uh, listening to the rustling and finding these bear patches and saying, oh look, it looks like a deer sat down here. Oh look at this scrapey bit on the tree, it looks like a deer's been scraping the tree. And then suddenly a group of about six fallow burst out of the trees in front of us, just here. And I, I was absolutely startled and the children were completely agog and it was like, uh, you know, and um, that's the kind of thing that happens in here and it's just endlessly fun and it's taken me 16 years to uh, of owning the wood and my whole life to see a live badger and that happened about six months ago we saw three badgers coming down the track there's always something that's going to surprise you and I suppose um, the worst thing about owning the wood is the opposite side of the same coin which is the privilege and responsibility um, comes with the fact that it's so very visible to the surrounding community and you, you are actually very accountable which is obviously good that means a lot of form filling for the forestry authority and also for um, the fact that natural England um, sublet part of the woods so there are, there are legal things around the freehold and the various R lease and natural England sublease and um, negotiating with the shoot and the hunting and all the interested parties. And sometimes it can feel a little bit like everybody wants a piece of the action and, it, and you have to stand back and say, yes, but this is my wood. <laughs> well, at least for the next 150 years, it is. And sometimes we do actually have to ask people just, just give us a bit of space um, to enjoy it on our own as well. Uh, luckily for us, when we do get the officials in to have a look at what we're doing, which we do have to do um, quite regularly, and sometimes they'll do spot checks as well because we do apply for grants and we've been quite lucky to get quite a lot of grant aid. Um, sometimes we get grants for doing absolutely nothing, which is fantastic. For example, when we took out the last block of conifers, which needed to go because, as I said, this is an ancient woodland site and we want the ancient woodland to regenerate as it has been up until the 50s and the 60s. So the area that we've just cleared of conifers, of uh, spruce, um, we've actually been given a grant to leave that to regenerate, which is great fun. Um, so, but in terms of, there's, there's a lot of complicated ethics and, and um, not politics, politics with a small p, really, in terms of managing a wood. Because, as I said, people have all, everybody's got opinions on, on what's going on. Um, but, as I said, luckily, over the years, people have come along and said, yes, you're doing the right thing. Because, um, for example, the Nature Reserve is a triple SI because of the oxlips that are there. And we were recently able to demonstrate to the Essex Wildlife Trust that actually the oxlips are flourishing not just within the bit that's designated as National Nature Reserve and fenced against the deer, but also, weirdly, amongst the areas where we've cleared um, the spruce trees, the oxlips have hung on in there. And we have, I think we've got five different orchids um, in the wood. And so these are all indicators. We can actually demonstrate to people that what we're doing, getting more light um, to the ground in the wood, is actually benefiting the wood. And the speed that the wood is springing up again in the bits that we've cleared is fantastic. We had a big group of people around not long ago and I showed them the area that we cleared um, just in November, just gone. And it was like, oh, it looked like a war zone. And, that, and it is pretty horrific to look at it. But then there's a block um, just, and I say block because of course the Forestry Authority planted things in blocks and we're trying to still sort of mess it up and make it look more natural. But the front block, um, was the spruce was taken down seven years ago and now it's genuinely a wood again and um, to the extent that we've actually had red deer in there recently which is alarming for this part of Essex and they do do a lot of damage um, 
So again, you've got to be quite diplomatic because we've got a guy with a high-velocity rifle that sits in a high seat and, and sorts out the deer for us. Um, so you've got taking trees down and, uh, and selling them as firewood and explaining to people the reasons. But we're always happy to explain that, for instance, this lot of beech that we're currently turning into logs for our wood burner and for everybody else's wood burners, that patch of beech had some kind of uh, fungal infection and was dying, so obviously it had to come out. But that, again, that area is regenerating because the natural woodland is still here. It's never been a field, it's always been a wood. So whatever we do, it's quite reassuring, it'll come back. And we also have quite a lot of hornbeam in the wood, which is a tree I had never heard of um, in, when we first bought the wood. And it's very uh, twisted and fluted and very hard and um, that regenerates very well so those are the kind of the first things that come back in the areas that clear uh, aspen hazel uh, birch all of those trees that will be straight in there I think if people were thinking of buying a wood um, they shouldn't be worried too much about exactly whether they're qualified academically or or in terms of past jobs that have led to owning a wood because as I said I'm, I'm a social worker and don't have that kind of training at all but I think that what you do need to have is curiosity and you have to really want to find out what's gone on here before and what's what is going to be happening here in the future and so you need to be to be really interested in the history of the place and um, the natural processes that are going on in the place and you have to be able to talk to other people about that to get information from them because we've had so many groups of people in here who've come for their own reasons because they want to spot orchids or whatever but for every group of people we've ever had in here we've always found out something as well so it's taken sort of 16 years of bit by bit networking, picking up information and learning things and it's a brilliant excuse to go on some really good courses as well. Of course we get, in terms of wood fuel from the wood, um, for us personally as a family it's been really really important because the first house we moved into just across the road was very cold and we put the wood burner in immediately. Um, but as uh, Paul practiced on, you know, what kind of wood burnt best, how big the logs ought to be, how long he had to s store it for in the shed, that was for our own use at first. And uh, several years of experience of that um, enabled us to see what was the best combination in terms of logs. And then we did sell a few as well. Um, we had an old pickup then, which has since died, unfortunately. So we did sell some logs to friends mostly. Um, we also sold Christmas trees those first few years when we were getting rid of the spruce, that was fun. Um, but it, to the extent that I've never lived in a house with a real fire before, but now that I have, I'll never live in one that doesn't have one. And we did move house four years ago, again into a drafty Victorian semi. And the very first thing we did was put in a wood-burning stove and also print off a little poster which we tied to the front gate saying logs for sale and so now we just have people walking along the road and asking us and we, we keep a sort of pile of little um, sacks of logs about the same size you'd buy in the supermarket but much better value and much better quality and people can see that this is better quality and it is better value and we can explain to people that it comes from a local wood which is um, sustainably managed so everybody wins really. One of the satisfying things about owning the wood is knowing that no matter what we're doing on a season by season basis tinkering with this and that we do know that basically the value of the wood is increasing all of the time so all the time that the building societies and the banks have been going into meltdown the value of woods has risen and risen and risen and I think the reason for that is that people do see the real value in a wood. You can see it, you can smell it and you can, you can feel it and um, it's very satisfying to think it's a safe investment but also we do get um, a lot of pleasure out of it and a lot of fun but also it's a way into meeting other people, interesting people in the community and um, just to give you one silly example from recently, 
I was in the supermarket loading my bags and at the other till there was a, a woman who I recognised loading her bags and she looked over me and said, you don't have a long pole of any kind, do you? And I, um, I said to her, actually Paul's in the wood right now if you want to go and talk to him. And what she was looking for was a piece of wood to make a flagpole for the Buddhist retreat centre in the village because they hang um, prayer flags in, in the garden. They were having an open day and wanted to put up some new prayer flags. So that's one of the more unusual requests we've had recently. But Paul cut them a really good, um, pot, a really nice piece of aspen. But of course, because it's the Buddhist community, we're worried that we might be killing a tree. So that was a good opportunity to explain that this aspen was about to be coppiced in the, in the coming coppicing season. That aspen would be coming down but that we weren't killing it because this aspen, all these different poles were the same organism and that same tree is going to regrow and they absolutely loved their flagpole and Paul peeled it for them and, they, and the bark came off lovely and the, the, the prayer flags are all fluttering from it now and it's, it's beautiful. So we do get some odd requests but that just keeps you interested really. I would encourage um, any young people that were thinking of a career in working in woods, even if they haven't quite got the cash yet to buy a bit of their own woodland, because there is genuinely a shortage of people to do the, the hands-on things that need to happen in the woods, like the coppicing and, and turning the, the produce that's felled into usable, more valuable um, products, really. But I would say that the that one of the things that young people ought to consider is that you don't make a huge amount of money in terms of wages at the beginning. So one of the important things is to try and get close to a wood and I think if you get yourself into that wood as a volunteer or to live in a, in a place near a woodland there will be somebody who's looking for labour at which time you can, you can get involved. For example, we had um, a young guy that started working here recently who, when he first started working here, he was cycling huge distances to get here. And I couldn't work out how he could possibly do a day's work after his cycling. But then he, uh, he moved on to sleeping on the floor of a workshop um, with one of his colleagues. And eventually he was able to, to have a room in, in a local farm. And there are people still in farms and woods around, even in Essex, who are open enough and um, suggestible enough, I suppose, to take on young people who are willing to do that. And so it's not a formal process of lots of paperwork and applying for lots of courses necessarily, although you might want to, but to sort of take it step at a time. And the most important thing to do is to go out and find a wood, really, find out who owns it and find out what they need you to do and offer to do it. And this is the deer fence. This part of the wood is the nature reserve. This is the NNR part of the wood. And um, just to tell you an interesting story about this fence, when it was first put up, which is about 12 years ago, um, it was paid for and put up by Natural England. And unfortunately, they fenced some of the deer into the nature reserve and we tried leaving the gates open but the deer weren't interested in coming out again so eventually we all agreed, Natural England and ourselves, that we'd drop the fence at the end of the nature reserve and see if we could drive the deer out. So that morning I went down to the school with the children and I said to all the mums standing outside the village primary school, um, could you go and get your pans and your pots and pans and come with me to the wood and they went okay so I got a collection of women with pans and we started at the end of the, the nature reserve and went in a long line banging pots and pans trying to drive the deer out which was great fun but it didn't really work and unfortunately I think in the end we had to get the deer stalker in because the deer when they're locked in they do far more damage than, than they, ha they were doing before the fence was up so uh, interesting, fun, but not very successful.